my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Thank you all for remaining standing and good morning. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Lord and Father, it is indeed an honor to come before you and be able to enter in your most holy place. And Father, we thank you for the events that happened that we can do this. And Father, we thank you for your love and compassion for us. We thank you that you are all powerful. And Father, we thank you for this blessed assurance through your Son that you allowed to happen and the love and the compassion, and just the forgiveness that comes through that. Father, we are so blessed. Even in our darkest hours, we are blessed. And Father, we pray as we peruse the bulletin, uh, just like Eddie spoke of a few minutes ago, there is uh, individuals that are lifted up in prayer on our prayer list, and Every one of them have specific needs. Every one of them have uh, things that they um, require. And Father, we pray that you would address those needs and the requirements is only that you can being the great physician. And Father, we just thank you that you're on our side. Father, our hearts are heavy. Um, We don't want to apologize, but um, we, America is at a crossroads. Our beloved country is at a crossroads. And we pray, Father, if it's your will that you would intervene, that you would, that you would know our hearts, that you would um, listen to the things that we speak uh, subconsciously and subliminally. And uh, Father, we just pray that you would help us through this very uh, strenuous time of raising prices, a government that doesn't seem to care um, what we think, uh, how we feel. And Father, we pray if it's your will that you would intervene if, as you have done in the past. And Father, we know that you have allowed governments to fall. We pray that your compassion would be upon this government, that you would intervene, thunk them on the head. And Father, we just pray for good things. Father, we pray that you would help us to endure the struggles that we have. And without going any longer, we just thank you. We thank you for the freedom to be here, the freedoms that we still have. And Father, we're, things are so overshadowed sometimes that we miss seeing the forest for the trees. And um, Father, we pray that you would help us in our walk. We pray that you would help us to always look forward to your blessed assurance. And Father, we just thank you for so many things. But Father, most of all, we thank you for Jesus, for it's truly in his name. Amen.
these next two songs are to prepare our minds and our hearts for the Lord's Supper. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Hold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, hold o'er my feet, absolute sway, fill with thy spirit. Till all shall see Christ only always living in me. No tears in heaven, no sorrows given, all will be glory in that land. There'll be no sadness, all will gladness when we shall join that happy band. No tears, no tears, no tears up there. Sorrow and pain will all have flown. No tears, no tears, no tears up there. No tears in heaven will be known. Some morning yonder will cease to ponder or things this life has brought to view. All will be clearer, save ones be dearer. In heaven we all will be made new. No tears, no tears, no tears up there. Sorrow and pain will all have flown. No tears, no tears, no tears up there. No tears in heaven will be known. Clay wasn't able to be here today, so I'm a substitute. I'll try to do my best. First, if you didn't pick up a communion cup, they're out in the front room. Please do so. From Luke chapter 22 and verse 19, he took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I thought that's a lot of times in churches we visit, it's on a table, do this in remembrance of me, and started thinking about it. Would I learn something going back to the original language, looking at this in remembrance? This turned out to be exactly what it was a few verses before, the bread and the fruit of the vine. In remembrance, I didn't turn up any new things for me, but it's good to sometimes go back to the simple and fundamental things. The Greek lexicon in the original language said the word for remembrance, to remind, to recollect, call to mind, remember. Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the state of bearing in mind, the ability to remember, the period over which one's memory extends, the act of calling to mind, a memory of a person, thing, or an event, a commemoration or memorial. Now we were told to remember 
And if you all remember, from about May, I was up here and said, from our move, after we moved, I had lost these classes for three months. I found them. Well, we moved and packed up in August. Kelly and I spent the last two days looking for a phone. This is a phone we use as a digital camera, so it's so much better than the ones we carry every day. Well, we can't find them. Just three months. We can remember where it was. We can't remember where we packed it. So doing this once a week is good for us. It helps us to remember and focus on the important things. There was a, a quote from a German pastor I found. Every day we must turn again to God's acts of salvation so that we can again move forward. Faith and obedience live on remembrance and repetition. Remembrance becomes the power of the present because the living God who once acted for me and reminds me of that today. Let's take time to go to God in prayer. Dear Father, we are so thankful for your love, for your kindness, for the best of heaven. Your son came to earth and he taught us, he showed us your will, and your son gave his innocent life for us. We are reclaimed through him. Please help us to remember what that act means and that we had someone willing to die for us. Help us to partake of this bread, which represents his body in a manner which pleases you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's continue our prayer. Father, we return in prayer. Please help us to focus our minds solely on your son that we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represent the blood he shed, that we keep him in our minds and keep your word in our minds throughout the week, that we love you with all we have. Let's see Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now we have time to give thanks for the offering. We won't pass the plate, but we can give online. You can mail your check in. You can hand the check in the collection plate as you leave. Um, if you have any difficulty with that, you can see me or one of the elders or one of the other members. We'll be glad to show you or tell you how you can do that. Remember, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Let's give thanks. Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the blessings that we have. Please help us to give and give with the heart that it's better to give than receive, that we know you love a cheerful giver. We thank you for this church, for the church your son established. Please help us to this money that we give, let it go to further your church and spread your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Morning. We reading from first or Colossians one verses fifteen through twenty. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through through him and for him. 
He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. <clears throat> For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, making the peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now is that special time where we, all kids, age preschool through fifth grade, go down for their Sunday lessons down there. And this song will be right before the lesson today. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deep we stand within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love <coughs> lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else can help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I cling, in his blessed presence live. Ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. You may be seated. Good morning. Um, you may, if you name, notice in your bulletin that it says that Michael Summers is bringing our message this morning, that's not me. I am not Michael Summers. He's our, our minister here. He does a great job, and I appreciate everything he does for this congregation. I am Chad Barron. Um, I've lived here since about 2017, and uh, been part of this con congregation ever since. I'm very blessed by it. Um, he asked me to step in in his absence today, so I'm glad, I'm blessed to be able to have this opportunity to share with you some thoughts of mine. Um, I want to thank all those who um, participated in the worship today, who helped lead, Ben especially for the songs, um, the encouragement that those bring, um, and everyone else. Um, before we start, um, before I get into what I have, um, I wanted to share, let's pray. Dear Lord, I just ask that you be in this place as you are because you have promised that you would be. There's more than two I've gathered here in your name. We just ask that you offer a special portion of your spirit as we seek to look to your word and look to your truth for peace, and for guidance, and that you would speak through me, that I would get out of the way, and that you would offer some some words, some ounce of understanding and peace for us today. It's all this we pray in your son's name. Amen. So for those who don't know me, I am, um, as a uh, profession, I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I, I work with people suffering from all sorts of maladies or conditions, uh, depression, anxiety, family conflict. Marriage conflict, um, that's what I spend my days in. Lots of, I like, I, I found, I, I started out as a youth minister before I got my master's degree. I, 
I um, enjoyed that work, but I found that I was profoundly ill-equipped to crawl into the pit with people who are truly suffering. And I really felt God's calling to learn how to do that in a more, in more, um, in more competent, efficient, and um, helpful ways. So that's what I do every day, speak with people who are struggling. And uh, many of them um, come with a basic, it kind of boils down to, some of them will ask it out explicitly, and others it just boils down to they have a question in mind. And that question is, why am I suffering? Why is this happening to me? Why am I struggling with addiction? Why is my spouse not doing what he or she is supposed to be doing? Why is my child not doing what he or she is supposed to be doing? Why am I, why can't I seem to get out of bed in the morning? Why am I so anxious? Why, why, why is the question. It's a big question. I'm not going to answer that question today. I don't think it's a particularly useful question. And I'll, I'll share this with people, sometimes explicitly, sometimes more, more in a subtle way, but why I don't find it particularly useful. So let's talk about something else. What makes a good story? What makes a good story? What is, it, what is it that's compelling to you that draws you to a good book, a good movie, um, or any other sort of storytelling format? What, maybe you know someone in your life who's a good storyteller. What is it about their stories that bring you in, that connect with you? Is it swords, explosions, lightsabers, superpowers? Love, what is it that brings you in, that compels you? There's certainly a lot of captivating stories out there. Um, too many to keep track of. Um, you could spend your whole life watching Netflix and not run out of stories to put in front of your face. Or is there just one story? An interesting theory. A man named Joseph Campbell, no, not that Joseph Campbell, but a different Joseph Campbell, not the Campbell that started the movement we call the Restoration Movement, which came, the Churches of Christ came out of, but a academic and professor um, wrote a book called The Hero's Journey. He talked about the monomyth, uh, the, this idea that every story we come across follows a basic structure, has the same core elements to it. And it's basically this movement from hero lives in peace, uh, encounters a problem or a challenge of some kind, leaves home, faces adversity, setbacks, challenges, overcomes said adversity, and then returns home to a new normal, establishes a new status quo. And if you follow, if you, I mean, you could look at this and then kind of apply it to every good story kind of follows these sort of basic themes. Um, and one of them, uh, one very important one, um, well, this is a great quote from him um, that I, 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 use, I use a lot. I think about it a lot. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. That thing that's keeping you back, that you're afraid of, that's, that's that barrier between you and what you want, it's that that you have to face in order to get to what you want to get to. And so without that cave, without that conflict, there is no story. Without conflict, there is no story. Without adversity, without challenge, there's no story. I mean, think about it. What if Luke never left Tatooine? What if Lucy never entered the wardrobe? What if Neo took the blue pill? It would have been a short movie, right? Or a boring one, if that. We, in order for a, a story to be captivating, to have any sort of meaning or purpose or being worth retelling, there has to be conflict. There has to be adversity. Have you ever come across um, some of those? Um, they're getting they're popular online sometimes on like Facebook and stuff. Like these uh, summarize a movie in one sentence badly uh, challenges. They can be kind of kind of funny. Um, well, these aren't movies actually. Well, some of them are were made into movies. These are real people's stories. College dropout starts a company, gets fired by his company. Well, that's a story, right? Well, not a great story. A uh, painter never profits from his work, dies in obscurity. Um, not really a great story. 
Military washout, loses all his money in failed business venture, runs for local government office, and loses eight campaigns in a row. Lots of conflict there, lots of challenges, not lots of, not lots of reason to like want to know more about that. Newspaper editor gets fired because he has he, he lacks imagination, has no good ideas. These are stories, right? They count as stories. They marginally. They're not captivating. They're not, they don't grab our imagination. They don't pull us in. Well, that's because they don't include the most compelling part of the story that at the end of the conflict, through the cave, on the other side of the cave, is some sort of resolution, some sort of bringing together, some sort of, some sort of win, some sort of victory, some sort of overcoming. These stories actually have that. That college dropout starts a company, gets fired by said company, Steve Jobs, if you saw the movie. A painter that never profits from his work and dies in obscurity, and go. Now there's a, there's a little internet meme going around that he only ever sold one painting, but I fact-checked it, and he actually sold more than one. But the point still stands, he didn't ever make much money off of this painting. <clears throat> Military washout, loses all his money, etc. Abraham Lincoln. Not a lot of success up until his presidency. The newspaper editor, Walt Disney. No imagination, they said. Well, I guess he had something to prove, right? All of these stories are compelling because they go somewhere. Someone starts with from a humble beginnings, encounters obstacles, and overcomes. Status quo, conflict, new status quo. That's, that's the movement through conflict and resolution. And this isn't just true of stories. I mean, we're kind of describing the human experience, right? This isn't just true of stories. It's true of music, too. Music does this. And I'm not talking about, like, a music, a song that, like, tells a story. I'm talking about movement through tension and release. Because without tension, there is no music. Now, I'm, I'm about to nerd out on some music stuff right here. So, like, if you wanted a good nap today and music makes no, here's your opportunity. But bear with me here. So here's a, a, pipe, a song we sing regularly um, as a congregation um, in the key of, and we're going to zoom in on the first bar here. So in the, we're in the key of D. And a D major chord is spelled D, F sharp, and A. Well, here they are. There's a D. There's an F sharp. There's an A, and there's an extra D in the alto there for emphasis. So we're starting the D major chord. This is where we begin. Even if you don't know this intellectually, you can't describe what is happening here, you know it intuitively. That as soon as we sing that first chord, this is home. This is where we belong. And then the music moves through tension. Through it changes. It creates dissonance, and that dissonance wants us to go back home. It creates this like auditory longing to go back to where we started. And look at this. At the end, D, e, sharp, A. We come back. And that's how you know the song's over. You know those songs that we sometimes sing that end on a chord, and you're like, that wasn't, that wasn't the last note, was it? Like, and you're, everyone's like, come on. Like, that's because it doesn't follow this rule. It creates that tension. And sometimes you can use that tension to kind of tell a story. That this isn't resolved. We're talking about something that we're looking forward to with eager anticipation. All of our human experience kind of echoes this. We, we tell it in stories. We, 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 it's metaphorized in music. It comes together. We experience it over and over again. We can't get enough of it. We want more story. We want, we want more music. We want to we wanna, we wanna do this over and over again. Move me through Tension and release. A song with one chord might sound kind of nice, but it's not a song. It's not music. It's not creative. It's not compelling. It doesn't draw us in. And what all of this kind of is a metaphor for, this kind of opens us up to this basic truth that we, we know, but we don't often think about, is that without contrast, there is nothing. It's the basic way we know what is. 
I can do this. I can do this all day. This is a lot of fun for me. But like, let's let's take art for some for, for example. Here's Van Gogh's. Speaking of Van Gogh, here's Van Gogh's Starry Night, right? Um, so con without contrast, there is nothing. Okay. Well, let's turn down the contrast. I, I actually left the contrast at you said five percent. So you can kind of barely see it there. I originally had it all the way down. And it was just a gray block. Because without contrast, there's nothing. It's the dark hues that make the, the bright yellow pop. It's the deep blue that makes the little bit of red kind of stand out to you. It's, it's this contrast that makes the image compelling, that makes the image interesting. So, in the beginning, God created contrast. I'll show you what I mean. In the beginning, God created what? Heavens and the earth, right? He's, he's highlighting, the author is highlighting this contrast of here and there. There is not here, here is not there. There is a difference, right? This is a basic foundation of our epistemology, or how we know what we know. The only way we know anything is that we can distinguish one thing from another. So we're starting that from the very beginning here. We're, we're, we're exploring difference. And he goes on, light and darkness. Right? And notice, neither one of these concepts, light, dark, make any sense without the other. What is, what, there, would be no, there would be no sense of darkness if it weren't for light. Actually, darkness even, isn't even a real thing, a thing that you can hold. Darkness is simply the way we describe the absence of light. It's not actually a thing that we can have more of. Eventually, things are dark, completely dark, and you can't get any darker. Opposites. Day and night. A difference. Contrast. How would we know what day was if it weren't for night? We wouldn't even have a word for day, likely, because it would just be what it is. Land and sea. So we continue. Male and female. A difference. Gender would be an abstract concept with no meaning if not for the existence of, and more importantly, the contrast between two polar opposites. So in Genesis, we see this main theme. God made blank and saw that it was what? Good. This is, this, this is not without significance. We, we, I think sometimes we read this and we just blow by it like, yeah, trees are pretty, they're good, yay, we're moving on. Um, the ocean is pretty, it's good, and we're moving on. God's an artist, and yes, look, that is true. That's, and that's not even, that's not, I trivialize it, it's not trivial, but that's not they're all, all there is to this. In the ancient Middle East, the first people that heard Genesis, like, like, this was very likely not the first creation narrative they ever heard. This was, not, this was very likely not the first time someone had tried to explain to them, here's how everything you know came into being. There were lots of ancient um, pagan myths about creation, and most of them, like this, like this kind of relief from the Babylonian creation epic of Numa Elish, most of them um, kind of walked through pretty dire, pretty violent, pretty unpleasant version of cr the creation narrative. Um, basically, most of them kind of talked about how two gods got in a fight, and when, when one tore the other one's arms off, that's how we got the land, and like this, this, sort, this sort of chaos. Like Basically, there was a big bar fight, and creation happened, uh, is kind of what it came down to. And, and, and wouldn't that, doesn't that make sense, though? That without the guidance of the divine, without God's divine guidance, divine guidance, I can speak. Without his divine guidance, isn't the world a violent and chaotic place? Isn't that what we're left to assume? So wouldn't it make sense that these people looking around them, seeing all the violence and chaos, would say, like, that must be how we started. That must be how we came to be. God speaks through the author of Genesis. Saying, no, not at all what happened. 
It's not all how, how it went. That was not the intention behind it. This was not an accident. Because look at, look at the verbiage. Like, getting into grammar, I'm not, a, I'm not a good grammar person. I just proved it. God made. This is an active verb. It, 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 it hints at intention, at purpose, at meaning. God made. He set out to do this. It wasn't something that happened because he laid back and kicked, and kicked something over and, and land happened. It was, he did this with intention. He wanted this to happen. And when he, when he did it, he put it all together and he stepped back seven times, it says in, in the first chapter of Genesis. Once for each day, he makes something, steps back, and sees that it was good. What a stark contrast to how everyone else was seeing the world at the time. Chaos, violence, suffering, meaningless suffering. Well, how do we explain that? We don't. This is just the way it's always been from the beginning. God speaks into that context. He says, no, I want to show you something different. I want to tell you about my love for you. I want to tell you about my plans for you. I want to tell you about my purpose for you. And this plays out through Scripture. We get to our text for today. In Colossians, the first chapter, starting verse 15. The Son is the image of the, of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Purpose, meaning, intention. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Without him, our atoms split apart, right? Maybe in the physical sense, but definitely in the spiritual sense. And he is the head of the body, the church. It's us. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him, to reconcile resolution back to home through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace resolution through his blood shed on the cross. You know that every time you watch something on Netflix, you're watching a metaphor for your metaphysical, spiritual purpose. I think that's why these stories are so compelling. Even if they don't talk about God at all, there's something innate, something deep, deeply ground into our being that says there's got to be meaning to this. There's got to be purpose for this. And if there wasn't, why would we even ask the question? As C.S. Lewis observes. Moving over to Romance. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that would be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. This was all by design. This was all from the beginning, the idea that there would be contrast, there would be ebbs and flows, there would be, there would be conflict and resolution. That creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. You were designed from the beginning. You, individually, Yes, 
Individually, yes. But as a human race, the whole point of this whole thing was this ministry of reconciliation. We know that the whole creation, and not just us, but whole creation, all things, has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is not seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. We are in this state of yearning, of wanting, of anticipation of this big thing that has been promised to us. And that's, that promise has been revealed and it's been given. But back to our perhaps not so useful question. Sometimes why can be useful, but but I find it's tricky, it's abstract, it's, it's, it's shadowy, it's full of hypotheticals, and, and it leads to half-truths and partial explanations. And sometimes it can be really easy to treat those half-truths and partial explanations as the reason, as if that was the reason why this happened, when there's so much more to the story, there's so much more context, there's so much more perspective. We can, we can get zeroed in on that one thing. This happened because that happened. Well, life's not that linear sometimes. We want it to be in our modern scientific explanation, uh, scientific method minds. We want things to fall in this nicely ordered, like, I'm suffering because this person made that choice, so it's their fault. No, no, no. It's not that simple. But, it could be a better question. I propose, I actually have two questions that I think are much more useful. What meaning can I make my suffering? What story can I tell myself and others? I don't, it's not going to make the suffering any less terrible. It's not going to alleviate the pain. It's not going to make it go away. But I'll experience it differently. I will experience it differently. I mean, if, I have, if I can make meaning, and if because of that suffering, I can bring joy, and peace, and connection, and relationship into my context, into my life, what meaning can I make of this? God is the Redeemer of all things. How can God redeem this? How can God bring about that resolution, that redemption to my story as it folds into his story? The, the story. And another question. What do I do now? What do I do? I may, I may never come to a place of understanding of why I'm in why the things that happen to me are happening to me. That would sure feel nice, right? To understand the why. It's not always there. Sometimes you just can't make sense of the sense Sometimes the world is a messy, violent, chaotic place. But that's not without purpose. That's not without meaning. Yes, it is difficult for us. But without it, will we really understand the depths and the riches of God's love and God's grace? I would, I would say no. We have no concept of those things because we wouldn't need them. We need them. We deeply yearn for them. We long for them. We experience them in our relationship. And in, in the little everyday stuff, in the little conflicts, the little, little snafus, the little little back and forth, little miscommunications. We go through this process of conflict, reconciliation, and peace. If we allow ourselves to, 
It's all right there. We allow ourselves to see it. Can we connect to the gratitude that is available right there that can inspire us to maybe do something different? Maybe that doing, maybe that action is, part, is meeting that intention of our purpose, of that purpose that was given for us to intentionally participate in that purpose. Because there is good news, right? And that's why we're here this morning. There is good news. Not just the good news that because of what Jesus did, we're going to avoid hell. It's easy to oversimplify it in that way. And understandably so. Hell sounds pretty scary, right? But there's more to it than that. It's not just, you know, in, in Paul does this really interesting thing through all of his writings. In, in the Romans, in the Romans um, uh, section of Scripture we read, he seems to be talking about this thing that's far off. And that's because it is. It's this promise that will be fulfilled one day. But in other places, he talks about how we already have it. It's been given to us. We are, are, are redeemed. We, this is already, the work is already done. We need to rely on grace because he's already done it all for us. It's this already, not yet, paradox that we live in. So yes, the promise is far off. The promise will be revealed. Now we see in the mirror, in the mirror dimly. But then we shall see in full. But our participation is available now. Peace and joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness are available now, today. Really, in a practical, real sense, we are invited into this ministry of reconciliation. We can participate in it. The same spirit that overcame death is living in you today, now. And we forget that that power is available to us. And we, we find ourselves stuck in our fears, our anxieties, our sadness, our grief. It's understandable. These things are real. And they can be powerful. We have not been given the spirit of fear. We've been given the spirit of boldness to reach out and participate now, today. Hebrews says he has made Perfect. Those who is being, those who are being made holy. That doesn't make sense. Yes, it does in a nonsensical sort of way. He's already done the work, and he's working on us. We'll surrender to that work. We'll participate in that mission. Why melts away, and what makes more sense? What? Is the meaning? What is the purpose? What is the intention of this? How can I put intention into this? Allow myself, submit myself to God's will in this suffering. Again, not to be rescued from the suffering, which does happen. Not always. Not always. Paul prayed three times for that thorn in the flesh to be removed. God said, my grace is sufficient. Sometimes the suffering, the meaning behind the suffering is more significant, more meaningful, more, more important than our relief. Can we submit to that? Can we, can we be okay with that? That this is my part in the story, and that at some point, all of this will come together into the beautiful resolution, the, the wonderful amen at the end of all things. That big, beautiful chord at the end of the song, when everything makes sense, and every tear is dried, Every, there's no more death, no more suffering. That's what we anticipate. That's what's coming. But we can participate in it now, today. So how can you do that? Maybe it's baptism. Maybe it's submitting to it, giving your life over, submitting to that act of allowing someone to put you under the water so that you come up a new creation, a new being, washed in the blood, that your, your sins are moved from you as far as the east is from the west. Maybe that's, maybe that's what's available to, to you now. Maybe that's, maybe that's the decision in front of you. Or maybe it's just, hey, I've walked away from this participation in the ministry of reconciliation. I have, I have forgotten my part in the story, and I've wandered in the desert for too long, waiting for something to happen. 
to me to make it all make sense. But now I see that I need to grasp, I need to strive toward, with intention, with meaning, with purpose, towards participating in God's story. Maybe that's what's available to you today. But no matter where you are in life, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, we want you to know that you are loved, that exactly where you are is where you have been placed, and God accepts you there and loves you too much to leave you there. And we want to be a part of that. So if there's anything that staff here can do, the elders can do to encourage you, to pray for you, if you have a physical need, if you have a spiritual need, we invite you to come and let those be known so that we can come alongside you in that. So before we close, I find, I find it important to pray, to bring this all to God. So let's bow before we close. Dear Lord, you have woven an amazing story that spans generations, time, distance. And Lord, it is humbling to know that we, you have invited us to be a part of it. That you intentionally set up a time and a place for us to play a role in that story. Lord, we, we pray that we would submit ourselves to it. We would look to you for meaning, purpose, and belonging. And that, Lord, you would provide those things as you have promised, as your promises are true. And help us together as your family to grasp how high and wide and long and deep is the love of your Son who gave himself for us. Bless us and guide us. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. If there's anything we can do for you today, please come forward as we stand. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want to go on that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow. And someday yonder we'll never more wander, but walk the streets that are purest gold. So often tempted. Tormented and tested, and like the prophet, my pillow a stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. In that bright land where we'll never grow. And someday yonder we'll never more wander. But walk the streets that are purest gold. Now think me poor, poor, deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged, I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a robe and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. In that bright land where we'll never grow. And someday yonder we'll never more wander. But walk the streets that are purest gold.
Thank you so much for your